In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you. Archbishop George of Chicago, I welcome you to this cathedral of the holy name of Jesus. This church is the symbol of our unity with you. Here we will gather around the table of the Lord. Here the word of God will be proclaimed. We welcome you with great joy.
Please be seated. It is my privilege and delight to welcome all of you to this solemn liturgy of installation of the 8th Archbishop of Chicago. In particular, I welcome Archbishop Cachivalan, the Holy See's Nuncio to the United States, as well as the bishops, archbishops, and cardinals from throughout the nation, and in particular, the bishops of the suffragan sees of the province of Chicago. We are very grateful for the presence of so many civic leaders including Illinois Governor Edgar and his wife, Mayor Daley and his wife, leaders from other Christian denominations and representatives of the Jewish and Muslim faiths, as well as other religions. I extend a warm welcome to the family and friends of Archbishop George, who have come to this celebration from Yakima Portland, and many other places, including the members of his religious family, the missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate. I also greet those of you who are watching this solemn celebration on television, especially the older lay people, religious, and priests who built up this local church and those of you who would have liked to be here in person this afternoon were there room to accommodate you. And finally, and happily, in the name of the entire Archdiocese of Chicago, its auxiliary bishops, priests, deacons and their wives, women and men religious and laity, I have the joy of welcoming our new shepherd, Archbishop Francis George, to this cathedral. I am honored now to call upon Archbishop Cachivillan, who will read the letter of appointment of Archbishop George by His Holiness, Pope John Paul II. that some of you were here or at least remember when the Holy Father came to this cathedral in 1979. He came twice, if I am correct. The second for a concert, but the first on arrival 
to say I am here to preach Jesus, the name of Jesus, the only name. And the Pope, but also before, being the Pope, he was in Chicago a couple of times. Then you can be sure, during the last 18, 19 years of pontificate, he had many occasions to think of you. You know, he, is, he has received from, from God the unique responsibility to care for all the churches, the solicitude, pastoral solicitude for all the churches. Big task, eh? but God is with him. Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Great mind and great love. So knowing you, thinking of you, loving you. I'd like just to recall that recently we had uh, two occasions when he was close to Chicago in a special way. This illness and death of Cardinal Bernardi. And those were moving moments. The Cardinal went to see the Pope in September, just two months before his death. The Pope sent special representative, Cardinal Baum. It was also my honor and privilege to be here. And that was an important moment. I'd like to share with you that Bishop Goedert, the administrator, gave to me a wonderful witness of the feelings he personally had, which were the feelings of the clergy, of the religious, of the deacons, of the church here. Feelings of closeness, of love to the Pope and gratitude for the presence of the Pope in that important moment of the life of the Church in Chicago, surely was very important also for the Church in the United States, and even in other parts of the world. Cardinal Bernardi, now surely is looking down very happy and interceding for us, praying for us. And then, you refer very close, when he appointed Archbishop George. You can imagine that when the Pope has to take a decision of this kind, affecting deeply the life of the Church in a diocese, is very much present, very much present. So, but he was present not only in that moment of the decision, he's present also this evening here with us thinking of this great community, the great church in Chicago, praying for you, praying especially for the new archbishop, that he may have a good, happy, long and fruitful ministry to your benefit, to the benefit of the church and the society. So, the Pope is very, very present, very present. And as you know, this presence is an essential element of the Church. There is no Church without this presence. But also other elements, other presences deserve to be stressed. So many cardinals, I rarely, you know, in my job I have seen many, many installations. <laughs> no, no. Easy to see many cardinals together and so many bishops and archbishops and the priests and the deacons and religious, religious ladies, gentlemen. The church is very much present here. And not only the church in Chicago, because they come from, not only from, from Illinois, Cardinal Soka came from Rome. Because really, this is a moment to celebrate the universality of the Church. The Church in every place, in every diocese, 
is relevant for the church elsewhere. Imagine with a large big church like Chicago. So a great moment to celebrate the universality and the unity of the church. That's why you are here from many places, all together, in communion. As a matter of fact, and I go to the papal document, you will notice at the end the Holy Father is conveying a special message about love and unity. Love and unity. One could say, you know, the bishop has many, many things to do. Many. He's a servant of the truth. No less a servant to love, of love. We could speak of the love of the truth, because we must love the truth, and also the truth of love, as there is the truth about Jesus, the truth about the blessed trinity. God is love. We read in the liturgy recently, St. John. So when we say love, it's not just a, a vague sentimental feeling. It's something very much belonging to the essence of Christian life. And finally, all the rest is for love. You remember, faith, hope, and charity, love, the greatest love. Because faith, we reach vision, hope, no more hope when we have reached what we hope for, love remains. So, interesting, meaningful message about unity, common accord, the ministry of fraternal kindness. I never heard uh, an expression like this. A ministry of fraternity, of being brothers and sisters, of promoting sisterhood and brotherhood. It's a ministry. Beautiful. Now, of course, I... Somebody contacted me, I appreciate, maybe they are here, very kindly to ask him a statement, what I think, what advices I can give to Bishop George. I said, Bishop George, he's able by himself to find out what he has to do in Chicago. But uh, I am very close to him. By the way, you know, the only bishop I ordained bishop in America is Bishop George, in Yakima, seven years ago and very close to him, also personally, with my congratulations. I am happy that already he received a very warm welcome. Bishop Goethers, in his first statement, spoke, we received you warm heart and open mind. And this happened. And also Goethers rightly said, your spiritual leadership and example important spirituality and the example. I said before, truth, love, many, many things. The Pope is praising his prudence. You know, a bishop, poor man, he has to be everything. As you have to be everything. Basically, every Christian, every priest, every religious, there are no limitations in the acceptance of God's will. No limitation in the practice of our Christian vocation, which imp implies really so much and so beautiful. So my congratulations, best wishes for a long, he said that this will be my final post, but you never know, many out. We see many good years of long, happy and fruitful service here to the benefit of the church in Chicago to the benefit of the Church in the United States, to the benefit of the society at large, because the Church is for everybody. John Paul, Bishop, servant of the servants of God, to the Venerable Brother Francis Eugene George, member of the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, and up to this time, 
Archbishop of Portland in Oregon, transferred to the Archiepiscopal See of Chicago, greetings and apostolic blessing. Uplifted by the celebrated and happy memory of our venerable brother Joseph Bernardin, Cardinal of the Holy Roman Church, whose works and merits we foresee will remain for a long time to come. We now turn our thoughts to that Catholic community over which it had been our will that he, Bernardin, preside and which for more than 14 years he lovingly and wisely governed. We speak of the very extensive and very faithful Catholic community of Chicago, which after his sad death has been lacking already for five months its own shepherd and leader. Accordingly, lest that, that post be vacant any longer and in order to prevent the pastoral activity of that archdiocese from undergoing any loss, we are deciding this day to place a new bishop in charge of it, who by virtue of his prudence in judgments and his experience in ecclesial matters will know equally in turn how to govern effectively and advantageously that same metropolitan church. Indeed, we hold you, venerable brother, before our eyes. You were born 60 years ago in the midst of the same flock. We called you to the Episcopal service in the church, and happily we have observed you working in a praiseworthy fashion, first for the community of Yacun and then for the community of Portland. Therefore, according to the opinion of the Congregation for Bishops, we lawfully release you from all bonds to the Church in Portland and we appoint you as ordinary to the Metropolitan Archdiocese of Chicago, duly providing you with all the rights and privileges which the sacred canons connect with this office. After this, our decision has been fittingly announced among the clergy and the faithful, be solicitous, solicitous for the people of Chicago in the future, venerable brother, sparing neither efforts nor prudent advices, so that, walking in the footsteps of so many other distinguished shepherds of Chicago, you may out love for men to be saved, love, out of zeal for unity and common accord, and out of the ministry of fraternal kindness. In this way, you may do very much good, both for your flock and for the name of the Catholic Church in those places. Given at Rome, at St. Peter's, on the eighth day of the month of April, in the year of the Lord, 1997, the 19th of our pontificate, signed John Paul II.
Bishop George, you have heard the letter of His Holiness, Pope John Paul II. You are called by the Holy Spirit to serve Almighty God and the people of the Archdiocese of Chicago in faith and love as their shepherd. Are you willing to accept this metropolitan see in the tradition of the apostolic faith of our church? With faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and with the love of God in my heart, I do accept the pastoral care of the people of God in the Archdiocese of Chicago. I resolve to serve faithfully the church in this Archdiocese. Let us pray. O oh God, by the gift of your grace, you have called your servant Francis to pastor the Church of Chicago. Enable him to carry our orderly this office to carry out what this office and ministry of bishop and grant that under your constant guidance he may lead by word and example the people entrusted to his care. We ask this through Christ our Lord.
God our Father, in all the churches scattered throughout the world, you show forth the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Through the Gospel and the Eucharist, bring your people together in the Holy Spirit and guide us in your love. Make us a sign of your love for all people and help us to show forth the living presence of Christ in the world who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. familia de tu padre y anda a la tierra que yo te mostraré. Haré de ti una nación grande y te bendeciré. Engrandeceré tu nombre y tú serás una bendición. Bendeciré a quienes te bendigan y maldeciré a quienes te maldigan. En ti serán benditas todas las razas del mundo. Partió pues Abraham como se lo había dicho el Señor. Palabra de Dios.
a reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has bestowed on us in Christ every spiritual blessing in the heavens. God chose us in him before the world began to be holy and blameless in his sight, to be full of love. God likewise predestined us through Christ Jesus to be his adopted sons and daughters. Such was his will and pleasure that all might praise the divine favor he has bestowed on us in his beloved. It is in Christ and through his blood that we have been redeemed and our sins forgiven. So immeasurably generous is God's favor to us. God has given us the wisdom to understand fully the mystery the plan that he has been pleased to decree in Christ, to be carried out in the fullness of time. Namely, to bring all things, in the heavens and on the earth, into one under Christ's headship. In him we were chosen, for in the decree of God, who administers everything according to his will and counsel, we were predestined to praise his glory by being the first to hope in Christ. In him you too were chosen, for when you heard the glad tidings of salvation, the word of truth and believed in it, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit who had been promised. He is the pledge of our inheritance, the first payment against the full redemption of a people whom God has made his own to praise his glory. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He prunes away every barren branch, but the fruitful ones he trims clean to increase their yield. You are clean already, thanks to the word I have spoken to you. Live on in me as I do in you. No more than a branch can bear fruit of itself apart from the vine can you bear fruit apart from me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who live in me and I in them will produce abundantly, for apart from me you can do nothing. The one who does not live in me is like a withered, rejected branch picked up to be thrown in the fire and burnt. If you live in me and my words stay part of you, you may ask what you will. It will be done for you. My Father has been glorified in your bearing much fruit and becoming my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear friends, last November 20th, sitting along the wall of the apse of this cathedral and listening to Monsignor Vilo's moving tribute to Cardinal Bernadine, taking in that masterful reprise of the Cardinal's life and ministry and faith-filled dying. I never imagined that I would be here today taking on his mission. But then coming occasionally as a lad to this cathedral and seeing Cardinal Stritch in this sanctuary, I never imagined that I would someday be his successor too. If surprise is a sign of God's presence, then God is with us in force today. But surprise is relative. There are surprises and surprises. Last week, I confirmed in the cathedral in Portland. And as my custom, I talked to the young men and women to be confirmed before the ceremony. We went through it. We talked about it a little bit. And then I asked, are there any other questions? And one young man put his hand up and he says, Archbishop, who is going to be Archbishop of Portland? And I said, well, I really don't know that we should pray for him and keep that intention in your prayers. And he said, well, Archbishop, you're going to Chicago. Maybe we could arrange a trade and have Michael Jordan come here. (laughs) Now, that would be a surprise. With us this afternoon are some of those 
who shaped my knowledge and love of God in this city, besides my family and my religious family, the Oblates of Mary Immaculate, there are sisters who taught me. The Franciscan Sisters of Mary Immaculate from Joliet represent so many thousands of other dedicated women religious who have fostered the faith of Chicagoans since the beginning of this particular church. And with them and us are many religious brothers in teaching and in health care and in many other ministries around the archdiocese. There are priests, some of whom knew and ministered to my parents, as thousands of Chicago priests have ministered to families over the years. And they are joined now, as I was just reminded, by the largest number of permanent deacons of any local church in the world who minister with their wives and also by other lay ministers who are creating an expanded notion of service in the church for which all of us are grateful. In his first days here, Archbishop Bernadine often said that he was Joseph, your brother. Cardinal Bernadine said it also at the end of his days, and he truly was your brother and brother to many others as well. As I explained to the priest last night, I cannot, I should not claim such intimacy now. And it is intimidating to look at a cathedral packed with priests and seminarians, each of whom is giving his life for the service of God and his people. But I wasn't really nervous until I began to read the list of former archbishops of Chicago, those within living memory, Cardinal Mundelein, who was still archbishop when I was born, Cardinal Stritch, Cardinal Meyer, Cardinal Cody, Cardinal Bernadine. And looking at my own name at the end of that list, then I truly became nervous. And so I need your prayer and I will pray for you. I'd like to say something that in a sense sounds professorial and maybe even a little hokey, but it's a way into what I want to say in I hope a short homily now. Not far from here in the library of the University of Chicago, I once did research in the papers of George Herbert Mead, who was chair of the philosophy department there in the 30s and who created a new discipline, social psychology. Professor Mead used Christianity in his scheme of emergent social evolution by saying that it prepared the human race for universalism. Jesus, according to Mead, generalized neighborliness. Christians are to look on everyone as a potential neighbor. Perhaps Mead's theory came less from Jesus than from living here for Chicago was and is a city of neighborhoods. Wherever it came from, it gives me a kind of an opening. And so for starters, if it's all right with you, I will say only that I am Francis, your neighbor. What does the bishop bring to the neighborhood? <laughs> In any place, at any time, the bishop has to see to it that the whole church makes visible and available the gifts that Christ wants his people to enjoy. Christ's love, his forgiveness and healing, the salvation won by him, the gospel, the sacrifice he offered for us. The church makes all of these gifts visible in word and sacrament and action and service so that they can be shared. The church exists where the gifts of Christ are shared. We are church, we say, and that's true but it's true only within a much larger truth. We are church because we are in Christ. 
We are church only to the extent that we are in Christ. He is the vine, we are the branches. The church is neither a country, nor a corporation, neither a club, nor a seminar. The church is the body of Christ, held together for 60 generations by the Spirit of God, and moving forward as a pilgrim people according to the mission she has received from her Lord. In any place, at any time, when the church shows up, the neighbors have the right to ask, where are the gifts that unite you and us to Christ? And if we cannot show them, or only feebly show them, if we cannot make them public to share them, we betray our Lord. If the church is faithful to her Lord, how then does she transform the neighborhood? The church looks first and always for signs of God's presence in order to build on them. On his very first visit to Chicago, which the pronuncial reminded us of, in October of 1979, Pope John Paul II used our national motto, e pluribus unum, to remind half a million people gathered in Grant Park that the church is also many people who become one in Christ. But in our national experience, unity has sometimes been forged from diversity in less than successful ways. Unity has sometimes been bought at the expense of differences. And thus, only what we have in common, in a very abstract way, unites and can be public. Our many differences will divide and therefore must remain private. But this form of unity leaves us split within ourselves. We are commercial and political people publicly. We are religious and family people privately. It's a kind of tolerance, provided that we continue to imagine we really are all alike. But such unity is bought at the expense of fundamental differences, and it is too high a price to pay. And sometimes, an often justified reaction Groups will then react in anger and withdraw and say, here we are, leave us alone. And then the differences are asserted at the cost of unity. And again, the cost is too great. What the church brings or should bring to any society or neighborhood is the experience of making differences public so that they can be shared to create a greater unity. In the church, every racial and cultural difference must be made public so that everyone can come to know how Christ can be black or white or brown or yellow or red. If I do not know any Mexicans or Russians or Africans or Chicagoans, I cannot experience personally, how Christ can be Mexican and Russian and African and Chicagoan. The differences must be made public, but always in a way that they can be shared so that they can enrich everyone. In Chicago and everywhere, the church must work to make visible and share the gifts of Christ as universally as possible. The church must work as well to see that those people often overlooked in church and in society, especially the poor, the most vulnerable, the unborn, and the dying, must be made visible, both in the church and in society. The church must work to create a neighborhood in which everyone can be at home. We've not always succeeded, have we? Not only recently, but over the generations. When I was growing up, the Chicago Historical Society used to have an exhibit explaining the Haymarket Riot of May the 4th, 1886. The exhibit showed the placards carried by the workers who were shot. Their workers' organization, their union, their Verein, bore a German name. The policemen who were attacked bore Irish names. Probably most of them on both sides 
were immigrants and poor. Undoubtedly, many were Catholic. Is there some way in our generation, before the church goes into her 61st generation on earth, that this pattern of the poor fighting the poor can be broken? Is there some better way that the church can act as catalyst not only to maintain public order, but also to work for a truly just order in our society? I do not know the answer. We need to do it together. But I do know that justice in Holy Scripture is not an equality that suppresses differences. Justice in God's Holy Word is right relationship with a God who remains always totally different, totally other, and yet who loves us beyond our every imagining, and with one another, with all the gifts, the different, the various gifts we bring. Justice is right relationship, which delights in differences and helps us to share them. Can the church do that more effectively here? Together, can we do that more effectively here? No particular church, such as our archdiocese, restricts her vision only to her own difficulties and pastoral challenges. The church is universal. And when Catholics look at the whole world at the end of this century, we recall a history and a present actuality of religious persecution unparalleled and still continuing. And so we must be concerned about the religious freedom of everyone on the face of the earth before we go into the next millennium. Marking this century with a unique horror never to be forgotten is the Jewish Holocaust. And the priest who was my spiritual director when I was a seminarian survived Dachau, unlike many other priests who died there. And the slaughter of Catholic bishops and missionaries and catechists of evangelicals and other Protestants, of Orthodox believers in their homelands. All this continues in many parts of the world. It continues also in a particularly acute way in the People's Republic of China. Granted the difference in history and in culture, if the world is ever to be even vaguely a neighborhood we can all share in peace, surely good neighbors will respectfully insist that everyone be free to worship God, to be open to transcendence, free to hand on their faith to their children, and free to do that publicly with their friends and neighbors. The strength to work for justice here and everywhere comes from our belief that God does not abandon his people. Catholics and other Christians believe in the promises first made by God to Abraham and Sarah. We believe in them, as do our Jewish and Muslim brothers and sisters even as we also believe that the promises have been and are being fulfilled in different ways. But God promised Abraham that he would be the father of a people more numerous than the stars of the sky, more numerous than the dust of the earth. And we are both, aren't we? Stars and dust. For the times we have betrayed the promise, for the times we have been dust, let us ask forgiveness. Let the church ask forgiveness. I ask forgiveness. And for the times we have been what God calls us to be, for the times we have been stars, let us thank God for his love and his grace. But always and everywhere, let us live in hope. As descendants of Abraham, as God's holy people, as children of the promise, we turn our hearts and minds to the beginning of the third Christian millennium, confident in the mission that Christ has given his church, hopeful that unity among Christians will be restored in the way the risen Lord himself desires that it be restored. But since unity is his will, the search for unity means re-examining our own willfulness and humbly submitting everything in our lives, in our ecclesial lives, to Christ. I pledge to continue this quest here with all Christians who desire to do so. And I pledge to the civil authorities, especially to Governor Jim Edgar and Mayor Richard Daly, whose presence graces this occasion, for which I am grateful. I pledge my cooperation in working for the common good of all, and my honesty in proclaiming its moral foundations. For my life among you now, I thank God. For our life together in Christ, as branches of his vine, as servants of his gospel, and members of his body. Let us thank God together. Amen.
Please stand. With confidence in God's love and mercy, let us offer our prayers for the needs of all. For Pope John Paul II, bishops and priests, and all ministers of the gospel, may they preach Christ's kingdom of justice, peace, and love. una sola fe, un solo bautismo, enriquecido con una variedad de dones y talentos, para que la Iglesia sea testigo de esto hasta el final de los tiempos. aby przemoc i podziały ustąpiły pokojowi i dobrobytowi. Hội thánh tại Chicago. Nguyện cho danh cha được cả sáng nhờ vào nhiều hoa quả của việc lành phước đức. For this assembly gathered here, may we go forth to be heralds and witnesses of the gospel message.
Father, you graft us onto Christ, the true vine, and nurture our growth in knowledge and reverence. Tend to the vineyard of your church, that in Christ each branch may bring forth abundant fruits of faith and love to the glory of your name. All this we ask through Christ our risen Lord.
Sisters and brothers, pray that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Lord, we celebrate the memorial of the love of your Son. May his saving work bring salvation to all the world through the ministry of your church. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, all powerful and ever living God. We do well, always and everywhere, to give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. We praise you with greater joy than ever in this Easter season when Christ became our paschal sacrifice. He has made us children of the light, rising to new and everlasting life. He has opened the gates of heaven to receive his faithful people. His death is our ransom from death. His resurrection is our rising to life. The joy of the resurrection renews the whole world while the choirs of heaven sing forever to your glory. We come to you, Father, with praise and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ, your Son. Through him we ask you to accept and bless these gifts we offer you in sacrifice. We offer them for your holy Catholic Church. Watch over it, Lord, and guide it, grant it peace and unity throughout the world. We offer them for John Paul, our Pope, for me, your unworthy servant, for my assistant bishops, and for all those who hold and teach the Catholic faith that comes to us from the apostles. Remember, Lord, your people, especially those for whom we now pray. Remember all of us gathered here before you. You know how firmly we believe in you and dedicate ourselves to you. We offer you this sacrifice of praise 
for ourselves and those who are dear to us. We pray to you, our living and true God, for our well-being and redemption. In union with the whole Church, we honor Mary, the ever-Virgin Mother of Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. We honor Joseph, her husband, the Apostles and Martin, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude. We honor Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Isogonus, John and Paul, Cosmas and Damian, and all the saints. May their merits and prayers gain us your constant help and protection. Father, accept this offering from your whole family. Grant us your peace in this life. Save us from final damnation and count us among those you have chosen. Bless and approve our offering. Make it acceptable to you. An offering in spirit and in truth, let it become for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord. The day before he suffered, he took bread in his sacred hands. And looking up to heaven, to you, his almighty Father, he gave you thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Supper was ended, he took the cup. Again he gave you thanks and praise, gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of celebrate the memory of Christ your Son. We, your people and your ministers, recall his passion, his resurrection from the dead, and his ascension into glory. And from the many gifts you have given us, we offer to you, God of glory and majesty, this holy and perfect sacrifice, the bread of life, and the cup of eternal salvation. Look with favor on these offerings and accept them as once you accepted the gifts of your servant Abel, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the bread and wine offered by your priest Melchizedek. Almighty God, we pray that your angel may take this sacrifice to your altar in heaven, then as we receive from this altar the sacred body and blood of your Son, let us be filled with every grace and blessing. Remember, Lord, those who have died and have gone before us marked with the sign of faith especially those for whom we now pray. May these and all who sleep in Christ find in your presence light, happiness, and peace. For ourselves, too, we ask some share in the fellowship of your apostles and martyrs with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, and all the saints. Though we are sinners, we trust in your mercy and love, and do not consider what we truly deserve, but grant us your forgiveness. 
Through Christ, you give us all these gifts. You fill them with life and goodness. You bless them and make them holy. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and to the Father in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. que dijiste a tus apóstoles, la paz les dejo, mi paz les doy. No tomes en cuenta nuestros pecados, sino la fe de tu iglesia, y conforme a tu palabra, concédele la paz y la unidad, tú que vives y reinas por los siglos de los siglos. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us offer to one another a sign of Christ's peace.
who takes away the sins of the world, happy are those who are called to his supper. Lord, Lord I am not worthy of you.
Let us pray. Father, you sustain us with the word and body of your Son. Watch over us with loving care. Help this church to grow in faith, holiness, charity, and loving service. Grant this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Through the resurrection of his Son, God has redeemed you and made you his children. May God bless you with joy. Amen. The Redeemer has given you lasting freedom. May you inherit his everlasting life. Amen. By faith, you rose with him in baptism. May your lives be holy so that you will be united with him forever. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. A last word of thanks. With all my heart, I thank our Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, here in the person of his nuncio, Archbishop Agostino Cacciavillan, for the confidence he has shown in me, a confidence which I hope I will repay by the devoted service he asks, through to Jesus Christ, always through him. I thank the civic leaders, whom I thanked already, but thank again. I'm touched by your presence. I I'm touched also by the leaders from other Christian denominations, especially the members of the Orthodox faith, the friends who are here of Jewish and Muslim faith communities as well as all other religions, to the cardinals and archbishops and bishops, my brothers from throughout the country, many, many thanks, to my family and my friends. I cannot say enough, but I'll say some more at the dinner tonight. <laughs> to the... Uh, bishops and priests and deacons, the women and men religious and the laity of the archdiocese who have created this church, this marvelous church of Chicago, thank you. For those who are praying for me and with us at home, in hospitals, in nursing homes, in homes for peoples with disabilities, homes I would like to visit as soon as possible and as many as possible, thank you. Most of all at this moment again, in the name of all of us, I want to thank Bishop Raymond Geddert, who has been the diocesan administrator for his leadership in this time of transition. the installation uh, committee, which was chaired, I believe, by Sister My Mary Brian Costello, who has been uh, a figure who made Cardinal Bernadine's life and ministry possible, especially in his last days, but even before that, and to whom, to whom the whole Archdiocese owes a great debt of gratitude. To her many thanks. Also on that committee were the rector of the cathedral, Father Bob McLaughlin, and Father John Hall, the master of ceremonies, and Mrs. Sheila McLaughlin, who is head of the Diocesan Committee for Worship. To all of you, many thanks. And thanks also to the volunteers, the Archdiocesan staff, who make these events possible and beautiful and prayerful, to the police and the security officers who make our lives possible, to the staff of Holy Name Cathedral. To all of you, many, many thanks. God bless you. <laughs>